All right, it's like 95 degrees here in New York, and I just got done filming a conversation with my colorist friend, Andrew Seen. We talked about working together, how he became a colorist, and why colorists are important to have on every project. So take a look at the conversation. I'm Andrew Seen. I'm a freelance colorist, and yeah, I make pictures look pretty professionally. How did you get into filmmaking first? It was the watching the BTS of various you know, big feature films. I just knew that like, I want to be part of that world someday. However many years later, can't even count. Here I am, just <laughs> strictly post only. I ultimately wanted to become a DP, I think. So I picked up the GH4 thinking, I was like, all right, like, I got this camera, like, I got this new lens, like, I'm just gonna set it up, hit record, I'm just gonna win. Like, this, there's just gonna be beautiful images coming out of the camera, you know? <laughs> Back then, I was so clueless. Uh, you know, and uh, obviously it didn't look good, surprise, surprise, because there's a whole lot more to that, to getting a nice image. Um, but I was like looking at other comparison, like other online tests, like people would post their uh, cinematic tests of like the GH4. I was like, wow, why is, does their look so much better? And like I fell down this rabbit hole of like, oh, it must be the color grade and just like absolutely just lost it in this deep dive when, you know, looking back, if I invested in like lighting and, you know, some better lenses, like I would have been way happier, but I was just like, oh no, it was, it's gotta be the color grade to the point where even like, I remember on like a actual, there's like a test video on YouTube somewhere. I think it's still up where I'm literally in the comments be like, yo, there's no way this is a GH4. Like you're clearly using a red, like blah, blah, blah. You know, back then when I thought I knew stuff. And he just replied, he's like, dude, I just lit my shot. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, so anyway, that sort of just just snowballed and I just fell way down this rabbit hole. And uh, here I am today. Still. So in a way, your misconception dumb. kind of led you to like your career. Yeah. But that's such a common yeah. like thing that people think on, you know, like they're like, oh, my God, this looks so beautiful. Like, how did you grade this? And a lot of people ask that mm -hmm. and it's like. Yeah. No, we like lit it and then like we, you know, we we shaped it on set. And or it's it, like, oh, beautiful footage. Like what camera did you use? I got to a point where I realized I didn't know what I was doing at all in color grading. Like I learned enough to know that I didn't know anything. I just literally kind of cold emailed a few place like color houses and got like an internship at one. And then from that, I went to work full time for like a production company and I was doing like a sort of editor slash like colorist. And then through that experience, I was able to land a job at The Mill, which is a big VFX color house in New York um, as a color assistant. And that was like that was my real sort of boot camp in this field. Like when I got there, I was just like, wow, I really know nothing like my first day. I was there, I was like, I'm gonna last, like, I'm not gonna make it to the end of the week. Like, I, I was just like, you know, I felt like I was drinking from a fire hose. Like, the amount of information that was just getting shot at me was absolutely insane. I wasn't just, like, assisting for one colorist. I was assisting for five colorists, where, like, it was a full-on assist team. And because of that, it's just, like, I had that many more mentors, that many more styles to learn from and see, like, um, so that really exposed me to the fact that, you know, there's endless ways to approach it and it's just, you just got to develop it over time. So when it comes to like, when you asked me about, about like my first gig, that's the thing. I always thought that there'd, there'd be like this defining moment where you're like, okay, I'm a colorist now. Here's my first gig. But you just sort of like fall into it. There's no like defining moment. Cause like as an assistant, I just pick up, you know, like a director's cut that one of the colorists can do and I'd just do it for them, like that sort of thing. Do you feel like when you were working at the mill, you were learning things that like you couldn't or didn't like find yourself learning online or like just by virtue of like oh, being yeah. next to these people, like was it a different learning process? Oh, 100%. And in, I mean, this is like back when, you know, on YouTube, there was like maybe two or three, you know, color grading tutorials like on all of YouTube, like no one knew what DaVinci Resolve was. Uh, and the fact also was like, it was so hard to find, you know, footage to practice on. Like 
I remember scraping the web and all I could find was like, you know, the RE, like, what's, oh, what's their name, like, up against the Macbeth chart and like, that RE test shot, like, red was kind of cool and they'd let you download like three clips or something mm. and that was it, like, so like, also, that was the other huge benefit of joining like a big house like that was like all of a sudden I had access to all this footage to practice on like after hours these were like actual real world campaigns that I could just like you know once I was done with work just make my own little sandbox project and just like try to make it look good and then also even better was like you know this was after a real colorist had graded it so I'd like set my look up I'm like ah all right this looks sick like and then I yeah, could you could to what the colorist did having that like a professional version of the same exact shot to reference was like, that was a huge game changer in sort of learning. It is much more realistic to be self-taught nowadays than it was back then. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like I would argue that like you still like have more value in like being in a room next to somebody that you're learning from than you do like sitting on the internet all day because you're not like, Maybe you're not as right. like actively engaged in what you're watching. You're not retaining the information because you're not like being held accountable by like somebody that's like oh, yeah. there or like expecting you to do a job. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think like tutorials are really good and the available footage is really good, but I still think that there's like a lot of value in learning from people in person and like talking to people and like oh, getting yeah. live feedback. Were you working in DaVinci Resolve at the mill when you were there? Or what were you working uh, on? No, so we worked in Baselight, uh, which is a other color grading system. Their main clients are big post houses. And yeah, you can't even buy it as like standalone software. You have to buy their whole system. So it's like the panel, the storage, the computer, like everything. And it's just like forbiddingly expensive, but it's like, it's such a great tool because it's just designed for color grading from the ground up. And like the way certain things are done, I'm basically just trying to make Resolve work as close to Baselight as possible, like in terms of like the logistics of it. Uh, that's where I get a lot of my ideas from and how I work. But at the end of the day, it's like when it comes to the actual like grading side of things, like the images you're getting out of Resolve are just as good as the ones that on Baselight. So it's it's more of like a kind of logistical comfort. <laughs> that base light gives you when it comes to handling everything that happens before and after the grade. Tell me some of the clients that you work for. What are some like, exciting projects? Uh, runs the gamut, like Lexus, Neiman Marcus, Asics, I don't know, Nike. They're like a lot of big Fortune 500 companies. Sometimes it's direct to brand and I'm dealing directly with their sort of creatives. But most of the time I would say it's through a production company or an agency. So it's like sort of big, bigger campaigns, smaller campaigns, kind of runs the, the gamut. But yeah, it's been a long journey to get to that. A director comes to you with a project, they give you the project to do a grade on. Like, tell me about, like, what kind of conversations do you have with the director? What is the gamut of, like, you know, control that people want to have over the process and how do you kind of work mm -hmm. um you know from that point forward creatively what you just outlined there will shift dramatically from job to job and director to director some are hyper involved and you know they're calling me like as they're making like their pitch deck like even while others are way more like after the fact like hey i just shot this you know, do you, do you want to have a look at it? Do you, are you interested in grading it? Can I put you in touch with whoever that's handling the post? A lot of them get, get me involved pretty early, especially if it's like a sort of bigger job. Um, they'll have me like just look at their mood board and sometimes I'll create a, like if it's a very involved job, I'll create a LUT for them to use on set. And you go in with like an idea of what your image should look like that's huge already right there. So sharing what they had in mind and just references, like good references that are like applicable to the piece, not like, oh, I want Joker. Like, okay, like you're, you're. <laughs> that's you're, a classic one. This is like a commercial for, this is a commercial for like, you know, some new mushroom tea. Like, how is that relevant? You know, it's like yeah. relevant references that have like 
very similar setups to what was shot especially uh i think that's really really helpful and like you you do that and it's like it's so much more helpful and like telling me what it is that you like about each one because like sometimes you know the references will contradict each other like what well, you know in one like it's very high con and the other one like the blacks are super lifted and stuff so it's like you if you give me context too like it's not just like okay here are references of what i like it's just like oh no i like how the shadows are cooler in this setup and then like oh i like the skin tone here and oh i like the contrast here and I like how the sh highlights roll off here like being kind of a little bit you know a nice little explanation of what you like from each of these references really goes a long way in telling me like okay this is what they want you know how much of your own taste do you like to bring to a project like on the other side of that like do you like to have some like freedom to bring something to a project or do you want to like kind of have yeah. like really specific like references healthy combination of both i think is uh what i like because like i don't like being they, they just come to me and be like all right you're the colorist your work is amazing we trust you do whatever you want like <clears throat> i can cannot stand that i like to be confined within a space to then get creative within and be given the freedom to experiment within that more confined space because I don't know, to me, like, limitations are just, like, a catalyst for creativity. It depends on the job, too. Like, sometimes it's just, it's so, just sort of spelled out that, like, I don't need that. But, like, in the initial stages, especially if it's, like, a new sort of creative relationship with a director I've never worked with before, having that moment of, like, more back and forth so I can see, like, all right, this is where your taste kind of lies, and I sort of just calibrate myself to what they like and just kind of see help them really create their vision um i like to say I, I like to be sort of invisible like i never want to be that colorist that can just be you know you see a post or like a whatever piece of content and you're like oh that's 100 percent so and so did that great and some colorists you can really tell their sort of signature and that that's great but like i like to be someone that's sort of <laughs> like unclockable for lack of a better term is there a camera that you like to work with uh particularly when you're huh. doing a job or is it like is everything kind of good enough these days yeah so my hot take is i i don't think it really matters once you pass a certain threshold like cinema cameras these days have gotten you know they've come so far even like kind of lower entry level ones like I don't really believe in getting caught up on like oh Ari is better than Red or Venice is better than whatever like I think choosing the right camera for the job that will serve you the best in this like sort of settings you're shooting in and and I think glass when, when, when it comes to like nitpicking of like oh what yields sort of better colors this and that I think Ultimately, what's going to have a bigger effect on your image isn't the sensor at all. It's the glass you go with. You run the gamut with your camera, so you probably, you know, have more to say about that. That's like choosing the right camera for. Yeah, I mean, we just did the job. We just did a project on the FX3, and I, I yeah. think it was the first time I really had my hands on the FX3. I usually shoot. I shoot Alexa like most of the time. I would say nowadays, and I kind of in between there of like peppered in shoots with Sony cameras and red cameras. And so I kind of just like this time treated using the FX3, like it's going to like expose it like an Alexa, like push it, like yeah. just not think about that. This is a lesser tool. And it literally worked out like yeah. perfectly. Like I there's nothing yeah. about, <laughs> there's literally nothing <laughs> about that image that I was like, Oh, I wish it was more like, I wish there was more in the highlights. Like, I know that using yeah. like the 35, you have so much more room to like push the highlights when you're exposing. Well, yeah. But like if you're, you know, cognizant of like not being ridiculous about using the FX3 or, or any other camera, like yeah. you're kind of going to be fine at this point. And, and like I, you know, try to encourage people to use like I just said the analogy before of like, not sawing a piece of paper in half with a table saw like it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. like do use the use the tool that you can like lift appropriately in the setting that you're in so if you know exactly. we just did and was a job that i shot that it needed to be 
carried around a backpack all day and I needed to be able to like move really quickly with it, it wouldn't have made sense to use any other tool. I, I guess another thing maybe people would ask then is like, if you want to shoot something that looks like an Alexa, for example, and all you have is an FX3, like, is it harder to get there in post? Like how, what's the, what's the like lift I, I to mean, get? Like, but like d define like what looks like an Alexa too. Cause like the Alexa provides a great base and like, you know, when it comes down to skin tones, yes, I'd, you could argue it is the better one just out of the box, you know? So it's like, it requires less work on my end. It really doesn't matter anymore with these newer cameras. Like it's such a mature sort of product cycle, I'd say now that like we, we've arrived, like it doesn't really matter on what you shoot. And to me, I'd say like, you know, whichever camera body you can get away with that has the image that, you know, the passable image with the lowest day rate and then like use the rest of your money on like set design, lighting, like that's really where your footage is gonna pop. It's not, you know, what the camera body is. Why are we bringing colorists onto projects? Like why can't we right. just throw a LUT on the footage and call it a day. Like, what's the difference? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're just sort of diminishing your return on your footage, first of all. It's like, you know, it's like, imagine like spending all this time making like a really nice, I don't know, side table with like premium wood and whatever. And then like, you know, just doing a slap job on like the varnish of it, you know? It's like another advantage of using a colorist, besides, you know, obviously having it done for a long time, seasoned, whatever. Something that not a lot of people discuss, but I find really helpful, I think, is a pair of like fresh eyes that hasn't been on set. I haven't been looking at the edit for like over and over again. You know, I feel like by that phase, a lot of directors are pretty fatigued by like, oh God, I've been looking at this edit for a long time. And like, they don't know how it's gonna land with the audience, so it's like, I'm, I'm many times I'm like asked like, hey, what do you think of this? Like, cause I'm sort of like the first eyes that like outsider eyes that were there. Like I wasn't on set. I don't know that like, you know, screen right. There's clearly some sort of something that, you know, you can't unsee the set, but I'm like, I wasn't there. Like, so it's like my creative decisions won't be affected by that as well. So I, I love that point because that, I, I always think about that too. Like whenever I'm sort of overthinking something, like I'm like, okay, yeah. well, there's going to be a number of people after this that are going to like have an opportunity to notice it. And that's kind of like my security system of like, if other people don't yeah. notice this thing like down the line, then like it's probably not important. So I think that's a really great point. But yeah, besides that, obviously it's, you know, I have, I'll have better tools and just like, it'll be a much faster process and you can explore more routes quicker with the colors than just doing it yourself because then you might get attached to a certain thing and then just sort of really kind of paint yourself into a corner. Can you talk a little bit more about like the the extent of like what you can do as a colorist versus like just applying like a global change as like someone who's just playing around with a LUT or something? Well, I could show rather than tell because I feel like this could be a good segue into yeah, let's do showing it. Showing a few of the projects we worked on together. So, all right, this was the log, this was Komodo. And so if I just toggle that on and on before and after, that's the look obviously, but to show you, like if I'm just using the just film print emulation LUT that I was using on this one, uh, clearly just applying a LUT isn't gonna cut it because right. I mean, it's just, you know, you just definitely have, it's a great starting point, but you have to work the image. So just to go through my adjustments here, I think I just brought the exposure up a little bit, took some saturation out. It looks like, it's kind of funny to look back at this cause like, I don't remember doing any of this. So I'm like <laughs> looking through someone else's grid. Yeah. Uh, what was I doing here? So here we were, oh, this one's cool. Uh, I will sometimes try to kind of, when I find everything is too, like all the colors are just blending, there's too much palette compression, and that's sort of a trait of film stocks, uh, just to give it more visual interest and kind of make her face pop out a little bit more. I swung the the background 
to a richer green so it would like break up from her jacket especially because yeah. it was kind of getting lost that helps so much so like that little adjustment. little things like that yeah that you'd never really think of uh color grading then, is such a it's such a game of like like very very subtle adjustments small like 0.1 yeah. and it's just like exactly and it just like they add up to something a lot better in the end uh, I don't know what I was doing here. Oh, I'm just brightening her up, obviously. And then the tiniest little skin change. I just felt like she's like a touch too orange. So bringing that back. And yeah, that's the what was happening under the hood. Uh, if we look at a few other ones. And like some of them, like, you know, because of what's there, it's like I'm doing very little. Like... Like on this one, it's more just exposure than anything. Right. Uh, well, this is probably harder like, to isolate certain parts too because there's yeah. so much blur happening yeah. that. Yeah, there's not but a whole it's also lot. like there, there, there are. It's like recognizing kind of more key moments. Uh, like I think, for example, on this one, mm -hmm. I did a lot more. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you so put like, a lot on this shot, light. yeah, it's it's yeah. not. Yeah. You you re really have to kind of do some stuff so let's see what did i do here so obviously exposure big up and also that's like you know this isn't because you shot it super dark it's film print emulation lots do tend to kind of bring everything down right. um right so it's just even it out under that uh so just bringing the exposure up i don't know what else i did oh yeah i think this one i i did a lot for her skin i think yeah so i was like there's a few nodes just based for her face because I just didn't, yeah, there's like a collection of, if I do all these three, it's like mm -hmm. trying to get that green and mm -hmm. just like get her face in a more flattering, like just better skin tone. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this one as well was, yeah, <laughs> so I had four nodes for his skin. And sometimes it's just like, yeah, it's just, it's this sort of process to really dial that in because you know, for a piece like this, it's fashion. You just really want to make sure she's getting the best treatment possible. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, yeah, slightly just warming up the shadows here just to feel, make it, again, fashion rather than overly moody. Like, heightened reality is a lot of the times what we're going for. Um, and I don't know. Let's see. I think this one I maybe did quite a bit. Yeah, because it's such a close-up on her face. Oh, yeah, this one should be interesting. So this one, this is just with the LUT. I think I did a little bit of denoise. We got, obviously, exposure. Exposure again. <laughs> well, exposure and contrast. Uh, so, yeah, this is, like, the net result of that. And then I didn't do anything there. I think, again, skin. And then a whole lot of skin over here, I think. Yeah, so warming her up. Oh, where was it? Oh, I think I'll, wait, was it? Oh yeah, popping her eyes. Mm. So just like catching the little highlights in her eyes more because mm. you, you can see the light hitting it. So it's like important to make sure those come out. Mm -hmm. So here, like her skin on her cheek looked right, but her nose was a little overly red. It's probably very cold. Um, yeah <laughs> so i'm just i'm just bringing that to the tone of her cheek because to me it's important to kind of give it a more unison kind of look for the skin tone uh and yeah popping her out and then oh yeah it looks like i'm also like a stickler for when you have different tones from face to hand so mm -hmm. i just try to match those two and again it's probably very cold like i wouldn't have necessarily immediately thought about like the the way her skin tone on her face looks in relation to her hand but if you yeah. look at the impact that made on the entire image just turning that on and off it's like oh wow like yeah it's pretty major yeah. so it's kind of like yeah being really observant is important uh, mm -hmm. as well you never really think of doing that stuff but it's just like with time and like good mentorship like you really start looking out for those little details um, that like, you know, I, you, you weren't aware of these little changes I was doing, but it's just like, it's sort of like what I think is expected of me to make sure, you know, 
that you're getting the best sort of image possible. And then what else was I doing? Again, like slight little pop and contrast because I just wanted more of that highlight on her key side. Awesome. And, um, and then a little bit of blooming. And that's sure. it before after. So film is different. Um, I don't, with film, I do a rather different approach. I'm saying that now and I'm probably gonna just eat humble pie in a second, but <laughs> I generally try to stay true to what the film stock wants to do. Like I don't really, I just try to bring that out. Um, I'm not as much putting a look on it, rather I'm trying to just get the best digital rendition of that film yeah stand. would you say that I like, like when, you, when you get film like a film project it's like the look the film is providing the look like from the beginning yeah. and you're so it kind of takes it does it take yeah. a step out of your process essentially mm, yes and no like it depends uh sometimes they do want to add a look to it like i like my first pass is always like here's sort of what the film stock wants to do uh and then you know sometimes they've had me completely go a different way and that's okay but uh generally i think if, if you are shooting film like the goal is to you know lean into what it's giving you and that organic whatever the celluloid is doing you know um so yeah for this one yeah as you can see it's more just warming up the image yeah when people hand you and projects that are shot like, on uh tungsten balance film that has daylight shots in it like yeah what's the how hard of a process is that to correct for because i think a lot of people are like scared to shoot 500t for example like and mm, commit yeah, to that which and, this is what it was right yeah it's 500t and like yeah. i kind of always yeah. tell people like if you want the like flexibility of that extra sensitivity and you like the texture like you can shoot it in daylight and it's fine but hearing it from you i'm curious yeah. if there's any like you know issue with that or if mm. it feels like it it Correct. No, I'd, I'd think, no, the issue I'd say I run into more with film scans or just people shooting film in general is like exposure issues where it's like they really shoot way too dark or mainly too dark, I'd say. Yeah, um, I think a lot of like people are, don't. are just des desperate to like pull shadow detail out and I'm just like, <laughs> it's just not there. I'm sorry. Yeah, people, I feel like people sometimes don't realize that you need to overexpose film and it's like the key tenet yeah. of like shooting film is that you must unless it's <laughs> reversal or like unless it's positive film um yeah yeah um, so yeah as far as but re your 500t like a different balance then uh, I, I have no problems with that i think it's a totally valid way to go i mean obviously if you want to use filters on set be my guest to correct for that but like you don't really have to like there's a lot of ways to to get to the same point with an image. It's like the philosophy and the ideas behind making a holistically like beautiful image rather than being like I press this button and now this happens like I Exactly. Yeah. Like I don't I don't want to foster that and I am sort of gatekeeping in a way because like I hope you hide my node tree on this and you know it's like things that took me a long time to develop that I'm not really willing to share uh, because also like what works for me might not work for you. Like that, it's such like a subjective thing in that manner too. It's like, that's why I want to foster like the mentality and then you figure out what sort of works for you. Uh, and just in general, like the flood of information on the web and everything really has taken a toll on sort of more mentorship relationships. Uh, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I feel like people probably don't seek I, them out as much or like, I think the yeah. worst thing that could happen, and I don't know for sure if this is happening a lot or not, but I think the worst thing that could happen is like people don't think they need them because they have access yeah. to the information on the internet. And it's like, you know, we talked about yeah. before, like there's such a value to being in the room with somebody and learning from them in like a specific 100%. use case process. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, to me, that's priceless. There's just so many nuggets and just just relationships in general too that you're just sort of missing out on what's coming up for you what's next for you what do you hope to do kind of next with your career so i'm just sort of trying to carve out more of a niche 
in in my sort of realm um i really enjoyed working on this this was years ago but uh, i worked on this amazon prime promo for the wheel of time i don't know if you ever saw it it was like the origin stories and it was all cg slash map paintings and it was one of my the few projects i've done that were like pure just computer generated images and i just i was obsessed with that so i'm trying to really try to steer my kind of niche that way because i i don't know i'm very very interested in the process so grading stuff like gameplay cinematics and stuff like that, that that's where i'd like to be um but yeah for now it's just commercials a few feature films you know just run-of-the-mill stuff sick well yeah that also sounds like a maybe more future proof kind of career path as well so with all the <laughs> The rise we'll of the see, robots. We'll see. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen like Sora and like the runway models and. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other. Like the new runway model. That's a whole other video. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, we'll, we'll dive into that sometime. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for having me on this. It's it's always fun to dive in old projects and reminisce on what we did and, yeah, we'll be working together again soon. Hopefully. Definitely will be. And, yeah. All right. Thanks, man. Cool.